we are live. Uh, we are just going to wait for a few minutes uh, for people to join in before we get started with the live webinar. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. I'm Shweta Vendapani. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. And in today's webinar, we're going to discuss scaling up solid waste management project, projects in Indonesia. Before we get started, I just want to remind everyone about what we do at Be Waste Wise. Uh, we believe in the principles of dialogue and diversity. And we have been organizing two webinars on several different topics related to waste across the globe. Every month, we host two webinars. And uh, just a reminder that we have a fundraising campaign going on, the link to which I will drop in the chat. So do pass it along. And if you see value in the work that we do, contribute whatever amounts you can contribute. So coming to today's webinar, like I did mention earlier, the topic for today's webinar is scaling up solid waste management projects in Indonesia. The project stop is based in uh, project stop is based in Indonesia and the mission of the project is to design, implement and scale circular economy solutions to stop ocean and environmental plastic pollution in Southeast Asia. And we have three people from Project Stop who are going to discuss uh, solid waste ma management projects in Indonesia. We have Mike Webster who will moderate the discussion. He's the Project Stop program director. We have Haricha Tambunan who's a governance officer and a regional public service entity expert. And we have Lakshmi Satria who is a uh, senior associate with uh, System IQ. And just a reminder, we will take your questions. Please use the Q&A section. Uh, do not use chat. It might get lost over there. If there are any other conversations you have to, you want to have on chat, you want to add your comments, you want to introduce yourselves, please feel free to use chat. Over to you, Mike, and your team. Hi, thank you, Sweta. Um, my name is Mike Webster. I'm a director at Project Stop. I'm just going to quickly... Uh, share my screen um, and so um, I'm a director of Project Stop um, and uh, I've been uh, based out in Indonesia for the last um, three or so years working with Systemic who's the delivery partner at Project Stop for almost four years um, Perhaps uh, Icha and uh, Lakshmi, you'd like to introduce yourselves. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Lakshmi, and I've been with Systemic for um, one year and a half, I think. Um, and I'm project managing a couple of innovations work stream uh, in uh, our project in East Java in Banyuwangi, um, and also um, project managing the uh, policy piece, uh, especially for national government and also policy um, in Indonesia. Over to you, Icha. Thank you, Lakshmi. Uh, hi, my name is Hari Chatambunan, uh, but you can call me Icha. So I'm a governance officer and also I'm a regional public service entity expert. So uh, I'm joining Systemic um, in January will be four years. And then uh, my my experience working in a, a Systemic is governance, working with the government and working with the stakeholder uh, and then drafting the policy uh especially for waste management and also uh concern for the budget uh government budget so this is uh what i focus in systemic thank you back to you Sweta. um well I, it'll Sorry. it'll be me i'm just going to introduce quickly uh who um why are we here first of all and what are we doing so um only around 40 percent of solid waste is collected and managed in indonesia um, as a result, 60% is not, um, and that um, uh, that means that Indonesia actually, given its um, level of um, economic development, and it's very much a middle-income country, uh, and has seen huge economic development in the last 40 or so years, um, does underperform in terms of solid waste management, and the uh, Indonesian government is focused on addressing this, and um, we are quite simply project stop is quite simply set up to address this so just uh just to focus how much you know 60 percent of that waste is collected uh, un uh unmanaged um and over half of that is burnt um there is a lot of open dumping and there is a significant amount of leakage into seas lakes and rivers 
Um, and who is Project Stop? Well, we are a, a, a big partnership. And so um, each of Lexmi and I are employed by Systemic. We are the delivery partner um, of Project Stop. So we have the teams on the ground making sure everything happens. Our co-founder is Borealis, um, a polyolefins producer from Austria. Um, working in um, virgin plastic production and uh, recycling as well. And we have a number of players on the plastic supply chain and uh, consumer goods um, companies that you'll have heard of, some of which you won't, who are um, working with us. But increasingly, we have um, a number of government partners. So we have had a long-term relationship with the uh, Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, we have a large program uh, funded by USAID at the moment. We also are working with uh, Royal Academy, Academy of Engineering, Engineering X program on open burning. We also um, have um, strong and ongoing partnerships with um, a number of national and regional ministries. Um, and I think you'll hear that partnership is is a key, key part of, of our approach throughout this um, presentation. We're also working with the Pisces, Pisces program, working with a range of UK and Indonesian um, academic organisations to look at a whole range of uh, kind of impacts uh, and effects of uh, waste and plastic waste pollution. Um, so that's us. I, I am now going to uh, be quiet and hand over to Laxmi. Laxmi, please. Thanks, Mike. So I want to walk you through um, our journey in Indonesia. Um, so our journey began in Munchar. It is a very small uh, village district in the eastern uh, side of East Java. So Munchar population uh, that we provided access to uh, waste management is around uh, 100k. Uh, and that time, uh, Munchar was a place, it, it's actually like a fishing village, uh, but the beach is not the cleanest in the world. Um, so um, we, together with the government, uh, initially um, launch Project Stop There, um, where we give access to people um, to uh, waste collection and also waste sortation systems in Munchar. And at that moment, uh, we were able to set up um, two um, material recovery facilities to help them uh, process and also sort the waste um, for the better. And also uh, at that time, we were able to create um, 30, around 35 job creations there uh, in Munchar. And then after that, uh, our journey uh, then uh, starts uh, with another two stop cities, which is Jembrana. Uh, it's it's uh, a city in uh, Bali and also in Pasuruan, uh, another city in Java. Uh, also, um, in our spirit of um, handling the ocean plastic. Um, so in Pasuran and Jimbrana, we then set up, uh, help the government and also the community there to set up a small scale um, waste uh, management uh, collection and also sortation systems uh, that we piloted uh, building two more and also one more uh, material recovery facility in Jimbrana and Pasuruan. And we were able to um, serve a population uh, of around um, 200K uh, in both cities. Uh, and then from our pilot cities, um, we were then able to um, scale up. Uh, this is the, the current process that we're doing. Uh, it's in Banyuwangi. It's a, a regency in East Java, um, serving, uh, aiming to serve a 1.7 million of population. This is a project that we're still ongoing. Uh, and at the moment, uh, we have built um, one material recovery facility um, with a capacity of, of 84 tons. In our stop cities, as well as in Banyuwangi, we're not only doing um, beach cleanups and also uh, hotspot cleanups, but we're pr pretty much doing like everything from end to end, um, starting from uh, designing a, a, a sustainable and also circular waste system. And we also uh, design together with the government co-create uh, the waste governance, which Icha will um, deep dive uh, later on in, in her session. And we also help the government uh, to do behavior change, uh, which we do triggering to um, change the behavior of people uh, from uh, throwing their waste into the river or into the ocean into uh, participating into a proper waste system. And then we also um, help them optimizing the waste collections um, and then um, do a lot of trainings uh, for uh, sortation and also waste um, processing inside of the of the waste facilities. Um, other than that, in our uh, facility, we also do uh, organic waste processing. 
Um, and part of it is also piloting a um, couple of um, compostings, uh, which in uh, in Banyuwangi, the, the plant for composting is also still in progress. Um, it's, it's a big chunk uh, of the facility itself. And in addition to that, we also do beach cleanups um, for, uh, and also hotspot cleanups, uh, as well as uh, open burning cleanups um, for the places that we think is the more most urgent in the areas that we've served uh, with waste management um, facilities and um, on, to on top of that, we also do um, policy design and also uh, regulation design together with the government to change the whole system. Um, and on to the next slide. Um, so this is how uh, the waste collection and also sortation facility look like in our stop cities. So in Munchar and in Pasaran, in Jimbrana, and our most recent one in Banyuwangi. So it's like a system uh, where we collect uh, waste uh, from door to door from the households, which we then transport it into this facility uh, for sortation. Uh, and then we sell the material, um, the recyclables into the recyclers and then uh, do composting itself in the in the in this uh, facility as well. So this is like a, a picture of, of how we we designed the system and how it looked like. And on to the next slide. This is giving a glimpse of uh, how our journey evolves. So in the in the first three cities, um, Muncha, Prasuan, and Jimbrana, uh, we're mostly doing a village-based approach, uh, a community-based approach. So it's not um, so it's like a small scale, a pilot project uh, system uh, where community is at the heart of the operation. Uh, and at that time, uh, we're facing quite significant challenges, uh, mostly in terms of the economics because of the small scale of the operations, um, and then um, the the sustainability of the waste system is really dependent on the community leaders and commitment. And because it's a small scale uh, pilot projects, um, the operation is also uh, community led at the moment. Uh, and, and by having that, uh, we have quite a, a limited financial leverage. And uh, the things that we can change uh, system wise is also limited uh, at, um, region, at the village level and also at district level uh, at maximum, uh, which is which is why uh, then uh, there is there is a significant urgency for us to uh, scale up to um, to unlock like a more scalable and a more sustainable change, which is now we're trialing um, a scale up in Banyuwangi and Malang Regency. And for Malang, uh, it is already a government led way system. So it's no longer um, community based. Uh, the whole system is set up um, by using like a more professional institutionalization approach, which Icha will deep dive in later on how we, we um, sh uh, how we shape that. And in, in addition to the institutionalization, uh, it also still nurtures the movement at community level. So we're doing um, both prongs at the same time. And it also promotes uh, multi-stakeholder collaborations. So we're not only focusing on policy change, but we're also doing um, collaborations with multiple stakeholders, for example, like with the religious groups, um, with also uh, the waste operator groups uh, at village level. So it's still nurturing uh, the movements that is ongoing at the at the village level, at the uh, grassroots level as well. And by having like a larger system, so it's it's been proven to have like a stronger financial leverage um, to, um, to help the system uh, becoming more sustainable in the future. And um, other than um, doing policy change at regency level or at city level, um, in this bigger scale um, of operation, we're also advocating changes at, at national level. So we're also uh, influencing some of the most um, uh, some of the most fundamental policy change in order to make uh, like a local waste system more sustainable, uh, which I will deep dive in later. Um, on to the next slide. So this is how uh, our collaboration look like, uh, especially in Banyuwangi. So we'll have um, waste operator, which is like a regency wide waste operator aiming to serve 1.7 million of people. Um, this waste operator um, collaborate with a smaller uh, village waste operators in each villages. Um, and they have over like 100 uh, village. But at the moment we uh, are aiming to serve uh, 44 village in our first phase of rollout. 
Um, and then uh, this village operator is closely uh, connected to the village government, which the village government is doing uh, all of the policy needed to make things happen at village level. Um, mm -hmm. And that would include um, enabling policy for um, for enabling the collection of waste fee or waste tariff from households. Um, and this uh, village government uh, also um, collaborating with religious groups, especially for the uh, behavior change and also triggering uh, for, for changing um, the villagers' behavior in, in throwing their waste uh, initially um, to the nature and now uh, officially included in the, into the waste system. Um, and then uh, at policy level, we have Regency government, which is closely related to the national government. The Regency government is also actively influencing um, national uh, policy change, which we also support in. Um, and also uh, we have, um, we also partner up with academics and also local delivery partners, um, which is local in Banyuwangi, um, because they know the place, um, they know uh, who to involve in. So, so we're, we're collaborating uh, mostly with local delivery partners there, and also um, a lot of uh, philanthropics and also private sector around the area. Um, and on to the next slide. So these are um, some of the national policy reforms that we also advocate uh, at, at national uh, level. So what we advocate at national level is three uh, include in the three groups. The first one is on a governance model itself. So we wanted to advocate uh, improving um, the ways uh, governance model, which is integrating, um, which is professionalizing the institutional uh, setup of the waste governance, becoming like one, like a centralized unit uh, within a regency or city. It is the model that we're currently trying. Uh, and also more, more, uh, more uh, importantly, is separating the operator and also regulator functions um, to promote uh, a good governance and also a more um, accountable uh, governance system for the waste management itself. And then the second one is the biggest chunk uh, of the operation, which is the financial model uh, advocation uh, to promote uh, OPEX revenue, a, a stronger OPEX revenue for the waste system. And the first one that we, um, actively advocate is to record categorize a uh, waste management sector as mandatory base, basic service so that everybody will put uh, their hands on the game for improving waste management in Indonesia. And then second of all, it's also advocating mandatory um, EPR, extended producer responsibility as an extension and also as additional support into the waste system OPEX um, by uh, including uh, some of the bigger corporations uh, that is producing plastic waste into funding uh, the waste system OPEX. And another one is also about uh, operationalizing a waste retribution fee, because in our stop cities also, um, a lot of people are for the first time uh, paying retribution fee. So it's not a uh, mainstream at the moment, but we're uh, ad actively advocating that to make that happen. And also that will bring uh, like a more sustainable uh, revenue stream for the waste system itself. And along with that um, is also the digitalization of the of the uh, waste collection retributions, uh, which this is also something that we, um, we incubate in house together with Accenture is to make a system um, to collect waste fee and also to register customer more effectively uh, at city level. Um, and then uh, on the third uh, bucket, there's also an innovative finance piece, uh, which is uh, we're also actively advocating blended finance model um, that is uh, very important to help the risking uh, the waste system uh, operation at a local level and also plastic and carbon credits that we're also trialing. Um, on to the next slide. So I think that's that for my for my sessions. Um, if if there is anything, uh, feel free to put it in the in the Q and A box. Uh, over to you, Mike. Well, I'm just going to hand it straight on to Icha. So Icha, um, you're going to now just talk about the kind of the governance models as, as we scale up. Um, this is something that's kind of really important and often not hugely thought about. We often think about the technical approaches to waste management, but how do, how do you govern it? So Icha, over to you. 
Okay, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Lakshmi. So I will continue uh, my part. So co-creating effective governance model for scaling up uh, salt waste management project in Indonesia. So uh, this is the governance uh, mind mapping that we have in a uh, in our project in Banyuwangi Hijau in Banyuwangi. So where we need like uh, Lakshmi already mentioned before how we uh, pro pre prepare, provide uh, good governance and then policy and then how the stakeholder engagement and also the budget, because this is a uh, four element, uh, important element in the governance map, mind mapping uh, when we want to have a sustainable uh, waste management in, in Banyuwangi Hijau, because we want this uh, uh, uh this this uh this uh part this part uh, will be uh scale up uh how to uh to scale up the waste management in Banyuwangi Hijau because if uh in in Banyuwangi Hijau we want that government uh will be the leader of this project so the if before in our previous project in uh stop it will be community based but in Banyuwangi Hijau it will be uh, government led so how the policy how is the governance and then how is the stock, uh, stakeholder engagement and also budget will be uh provide in this uh waste management so uh next mike so uh we already have uh, some uh, study about the waste management uh, system that uh, proper for Indonesia. And then we find some ideally waste system will be independently governed, uh, separate from politics because politics is very influenced in the, uh, in the, in the Indonesia. Uh, and then this is, will be coordinated at regency level to ensure a broad uh, view and few gaps in the waste collection coverage. So we have the we find some criteria for an ideal waste system governance uh, because uh, this is, will be different with the previous uh, project. So the first is a loss uh, for coordination of waste system across all per agency because mostly uh, the system that we have in Indonesia is not full regency but only like some villages like two or maybe 10 villages only. So this is not, uh, co the coverage is not full or not a bigger coverage. So uh, this is one, uh, the first uh, criteria that we need in the, in, the, in the waste system that we want to do in the Banyuwangi. And then the second can legally accept funds from multiple revenue resources, including government funding. Uh, when we talk about the community base, mostly they don't get government funding but in the future and in the in the Banyuwangi that we conduct now uh government funding household and business waste collection fees uh and then with uh polarization from recycling sales and compost and also uh compost sales and then private sector co-funding through PRO and then plastic credit EPR GSR or similar and then the third is waste system funds can be transfer, uh, transparently and independently managed from the Regency City Treasury because mostly if we get the uh, retribution or a fee from the from the community uh, waste fee, uh, mostly go to the uh, city or Regency Treasury and then it will be mixed with the other uh, revenue and uh, mostly the revenue not go directly for waste management but uh, separate uh, with uh, not separate but it will be mixed with other other costs that uh, pay and then the the last is all, all funds collected are used for the waste system like i mentioned before that uh, mostly the revenue for the uh, revenue from waste uh, waste fee or waste retribution goes to treasury uh, city treasury but not directly goes uh, and then not go, uh, not uh, directly go to the uh, waste management uh, in the in the in the allocation budget for government. Uh, can you the next, Mike? So uh, in the Indonesia uh, nowadays that there are four uh, four uh, ten uh, system governance system that Indonesia existing for the waste system, and then for the stop. 
uh, we already tried for five uh, system in Indonesia, uh, community based like KSM, Bumdes, uh, Bumdes. This is a village and community based. So it comes from the community and then uh, managed by community. And then the next is uh, there are uh, UPTD and Bell UD. So UPTD and Bell UD is almost the same, but Bell UD is uh, the the scale up of UPTD. This is government uh, government uh, institution. So what's the difference of this uh, uh, ten existing uh, waste system? Is uh, there's a point like governance level and ownership? So community based, it will be uh, owned by community, owned by village, and then for the coverage. For community based, like I mentioned before, it's mostly like one village, two village, not a uh, full regency. And then village fund, uh, this is a uh, allocated budget from the village. So, and then regency budget, and this is uh, not always a uh, community based, community based, not always get the regency budget. And then the waste retribution, they can do, uh, can uh, have. A retribution, waste retribution, and then sales revenue. Uh, this is also uh, they can do uh, in the in their in their waste system. Private uh, working uh, with the private sector also. So uh, why Bell UD? Uh, Bell UD because this is in this, uh, in government institutional that we think that they will get the government uh, funding and then the full regency, and then this is also can do sales. Mostly the government institution can do sales uh, for their activity because they're mostly public self uh, service, not uh, business oriented. But the Bell UD is a business uh, business oriented, even though they are uh, owned by government. So why we choose Bell UD? Firstly, because they will get the funding from Regency. It means that it uh, it will be safe uh, for the funding and uh, for the one year. I mean, they always uh, get allocated budget from the government, and also they can do uh, sellers. This is also get the revenue for the Bell UD, and they can uh, manage their their revenue and their uh, and their uh, and their fee also. Because mostly, if institutional uh, government institutional waste retribution will be uh, officiated by the government. And then it will be different with uh with uh the Bell UD because Bell UD can get their own uh fee uh calculation mm -hmm. and we can calculate this fee uh, based on op operational and capex. So it means that uh, Bell UD get the flexibility to improve their uh, in, uh their system and then this is also uh, will be business oriented. It means that they can get revenue uh. From the from the uh, activity, their waste activity. Next slide. So uh, what we have now. So Banyuwangi in Banyuwangi, we already have Bell UD as a as operator for the waste management for this year. So this is uh, we start since uh, August the Bell UD uh, to operate. Uh, Waste in the in the in the uh, Banyuwangi. So this is the the picture, some pictures of our 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 activity with the Bell UD. So Bell UD can working together uh, directly with the village uh, government, with the private sector, with the individual. So they can work uh, together, collaborate together. So we'll so the Bell UD can get the revenue from this collaboration, and then also the the Bell UD also can get the, this is the one of the regulation that they have about the fee. So the Bell UD can uh, manage their fee. It depends on uh, their CAPEX and OPEX. So it will different with the um, regency retribution, uh, waste regency retribution. And this is one of the uh, service uh, activity. So managed by the Bell UD. So this is uh, working with the uh, with the community to collect the fee uh, to to collect the waste their waste, and 
the uh, in the next picture is working with the government this is uh we always have a meeting with the government this is uh usually we talk about the uh, budget and then also about the um planning so the bell UD always have planning like five years strategy planning uh to to um, to manage uh, their 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 business uh, their business process and activity in the in Bell UD. So in the next picture is uh, working with other other stakeholder with the national uh, with the national uh, government and also other other Bell UD already existing in other places. And then the other pictures is how the government also uh, draft the prognosis. Uh, about their business, so this is the planning business of the Bell UD that will uh, work uh, in four five years. So this is some of uh, of activity of Bell UD that we work in Banyuwangi to manage uh, to do as an operator in in waste management in Banyuwangi. This is uh, the Bell UD is um, owned by government, so under the environment environment agency uh, in 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 Banyuwangi. So uh for the next the for the next uh slide. I think this is back to you, Mike, uh, because this is conclusion and lesson learned uh from yes. our discussion. <clears throat> Thank you. So there's been lots of lots of some some really good and perceptive questions uh that we'll come on to in a second. But um and we've got a bit of time left to kind of run through questions, which is great. So um, I think, um, first of all, you saw kind of Laxmi describe our journey from uh, more village level com and community based um, programs and scaling up to um, regency level. So regency would be the equivalent of a county or a state, I guess, with a, you know, with a population of a couple of million. And um, that um, scaling, um, I don't know if anyone's seen recent, uh, David Wilson produced a uh, a kind of magnum opus, a uh, uh, very interesting uh, paper looking at, um, and it's in, in the uh, the ISWA um, journal, uh, kind of clearly linking um, scaling up of um, waste operations with efficiencies, professionalization. And if you, for instance, look historically at some European countries, uh, UK and France, when they scaled up their waste systems, it was associated with kind of improved disposal, improved prof professionalization, and improved economies of scale. And that's that's where we're going. Now, um, of course, you need governments who are ready to do that, but that's kind of been the journey um, that you have to be on. So a few of our conclusions, first of all, government buying is absolutely key. And this, meet, this is at the national level where we are pushing in the same direction as the uh, National Government of Indonesia and their and their waste strategy and their kind of their their aims to uh, reduce environmental leakage and improve the management of waste. So we have uh, national buy-in support. There is a very strong local relationship. So um, we are now working in Banyuwangi, and we've essentially been there since 2017. So you know our teams have excellent links with um, the local environment agency, the local uh, government. Um, well-known the local communities so they are known they are trusted and they are um they are supported and so government buying is absolutely key and without it um you know there is no point frankly in 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 doing anything um so you have to be pushing at those open doors i've just talked about that kind of larger scale versus community now that's the journey we've been on of course governments need to be ready for that and you need to have um go government that is uh, able to, you know, and and willing to deliver services at scale, and you know, and at that point in Indonesia, you know, we are we are seeing kind of in the street increasing and stronger governance, um, and we are kind of part of that wave and saying, look, we can be working and delivering waste services at you know beyond the community level. So whilst when we have weak governance, often of often community level is that's all there is, and you know that's the kind of um, uh, possibly the best alternative. Um, you know, there are problems working at the community level. You sit, you end up with kind of lack of professionalization, nepotism, um, repetition of infrastructure, and so forth. Um, partnership again. You know, we are 
stop is an example of partnership up and down supply chain internationally nationally um all working in the same direction um in terms of the behavior change we work very much at community empowerment it's something that we didn't really have time to talk about today but we have focused we have worked with um women's empowerment groups historically in the first wave of stop cities now we are working in banyawangi with uh, the public health agency and there's a very strong public health message within the the the, the way services now internationally one focuses on kind of circularity and, and resource efficiency but within the communities focusing on public health stopping open burning uh, addressing you know flooding and lack of drainage and so forth caused by poor solid waste management is absolutely key. Um, OPEC support, and there's some great questions, and we'll come on to them in a second, looking at and kind of questioning, you know, how does one deal with OPEC support? I mean, in my view, that's the biggest challenge. Um, it's easy to build kit. It's easy to build a shed and buy some trucks and some trikes and so forth. But how do you, how do you pay the wages? How do you cover the maintenance? How do you um, keep things going? How do you repair those trikes and, re and replace them um, when they come to the end of their life? And to do that, and we're looking at, um, like to me mentioned the kind of the national measures that we're also looking at. So how can, for instance, waste be made a mandatory service? Someone asks, well, doesn't local government have to pay for it? Well, whilst there is a duty to provide waste services, there is no, it's not a mandatory service. So no, they don't have to provide it and they don't have to pay for it. There doesn't have to be that financial plumbing to support it. And we're interested in, you know, how do you do it? Well, you can either pay, get householders and businesses to pay directly. You can do it through indirect um, payment. And we're also wanting to see, you know, what's the role of, various forms of EPR and we're actually we've got a program which is actually trying to see if we can use plastic credits to be supporting the first stop cities and finally and I think this is a broader development point I mean we have been here for a long time our offices have been based in the communities and the cities where we've been working for a long time they know all of the local partners very well they can pick up the phone and say to the local Bupati, the local mayor's office can we have a conversation tomorrow or talk to the local environment the agency and say let's let's have a chat we have had long-term commitment from our funders we have had extremely flexible commitment from our funders so if we need if we've got something doing something that doesn't work we can start again we can and we can be honest with them and saying look you know this hasn't worked um we're going to do these things in a different way and we evolve and learn and you know it has really changed my view on how programs should work. I'm I'm I, I'm much more of the view that people should be working in one place for a long time, building relationships, and that fl and that funders should um, basically develop trust in trusted delivery agents that they can then uh, have a lot more flexibility. Inflexibility in funding is you know a real real problem um, in these programs. So. Um, I have spoken enough. I am going to um, just open the floor for questions. Twitter, how do you want to do this? Shall I keep sharing or stop sharing? And then we just go through those. Mike, you could stop sharing and maybe pick the questions based on how you think uh, the conversation needs to flow. Yeah. And then cool. Point so let's to just the, have, your colleagues. Let's have a look. Yeah, no. So, um, so in, I'm, I'm just going to, I mean, reflect on a couple of them there was a question about can operation be cash flow positive without any grants or financial resources so we have had grant funding for um the capex and that is obviously you know that's pe what people see they see the sheds being built they see the trikes and the trucks being bought etc um and you know as i think i just mentioned it's it's really all about the opex and i would suggest before you start a program like this you sit there and go okay you know how are we going to make these things you know fund this for the longer term and that is where a lot of our energy is focused so we've started from you know door-to-door -door, um household fees and that's what happened how, how we've done it um in muncha and pasaran and jimbrana and we've had varying success um in some places where essentially the local village government has bought in in in, in muncha in some of the places we've had very high payment rates because the local government was saying you know, we will take steps if people, you know, we consider this essentially a local tax now. It's about 15 to 20,000 IDR, so like one US dollar, one euro per month. So it's well within the affordability ranges for people. And as long as you have local government buy-in, um, 
there is, you know, it, it, it's something that we can see happening. Um, but without that, and, and in Pasarwan, we had some places where the local village governments were saying, look, we're not going to support it, but we will support it from the central village fund, which is essentially a kind of a pot that they get from central government to, 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 to fund various activities, and they have the discretion on how they pay that. So for them, they said, okay, we'll pay it, we'll support it through indirect taxation rather than funding, but it's something you cannot ignore. And when, you know, particularly if you're working in communities without solid waste management, well, the implication is that there is no financial flow there to pay for it. So you really can't just sit there and look at kind of introducing the technical elements, the, yes, buying the trucks and the trikes and the, uh, you know, building the sortation plants and so forth. But you also have to look at the financial plumbing. Like to me, is there anything else you'd like to um, uh, add? Because I know you've been involved in some of the national policy work. Um, yeah, maybe the the first question first, um, just a bit addition. Um, can the cash flow of the waste operation be positive without any grants or financial resources? Um, in short, it can, but maybe not today. Um, because today um the 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 revenue stream is not there yet. And also the policy, uh, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done with the policy frameworks. So maybe it could be a positive like in the in the five to ten years from now, but in the setup period, it's definitely going to be negative uh without any um philanthropy and also uh other help of uh, grant in terms of grant of financial resources. So that's why I think we jump in um, to give them like OPEC support and a couple of uh, other things to help them the risk uh, the entire waste system operation. So in order to make them um, be able to uh, operate in a longer term, I think we need to sustain like this uh, couple of first uh, years of, of setup, policy setup and also revenue stream setup uh, first. Um, and then um, I would also would like to take on the next question. What is the existing um, infrastructure? Um, so the first one is collection from household. Uh, and then from household, uh, there is uh, right now we're using tricycle uh, for transporting waste from household to household to the uh, to the MRF, to the material recovery facility. At the moment, we don't use transfer station because we want to um, serve the the closest area uh, of the of the MRF itself. So it's within uh, 15 kilometers. Um, so it's still good without transfer station. And within the 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 MRF itself, uh, we have um, sortation line. Uh, which people sort, uh, which one is the organic, unorganic, uh, and so forth. Um, and maybe before that, before that sortation, the waste is already sorted um, at the household itself. So in the in the MRF itself, we only do like a second sortation. And after that, I, um, sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, just just to kind of add to Phil's question, um, existing infrastructure in terms of in 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 Banyuwangi before we started, there was about ten percent uh, collection. Uh, there are no lined landfills, dump site, uh, no compost sites, um, processing facilities. There is in Java, Bali, kind of in more of the, the populated and uh, more industrialized parts of Indonesia, there's a very high activity from informal sector. So they are informal recycling sector. So collecting PET, collecting cardboard, glass and so forth. We are, you know, they continue their work. The material we collect is lots of low value plastics we collect little bits and pieces some a little bit of pt here and there and that sort of thing but not much you know it's basically what's left over after they've been there um but just and just kind of in the broader picture the reason that we ended up working in for instance Paniwangi, it is a you know, classic provincial city um you know that and, and as were the other stop cities so in the mega cities in Jakarta, in um, you know the, the the very big places, there is relatively high waste collection. Why? Because frankly, you wouldn't be able to move if you didn't have it. Okay. Um, in there's very rural areas. I mean, Indonesia's got eighteen thousand islands. I mean, there are seriously rural places, tiny little islands. Um, they have very little waste collection, but as a proportion of the population, very few people live there. So we've gone for the kind of provincial towns where there are actually quite a lot of people in the round. If you go there and there's relatively low waste collection. Sorry, Max, me back to you. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, and another thing that we have also in our facility is compost sites. That's that's correct. Um, and another another uh, facility is also like a bailing for the unorganic, for the plastic plastic. Uh, part of it, of the material. So we have like a bailing uh, system. 
there. Um, so I think that's that. Uh, so the landfill is not part of the of the collection system. It's like a separate post collection system owned by the by the regency government later on. Um, and then should I take another question? Um, I'm just. I mean, I'll just touch on kind of Joseph, the other part of Joseph's question. The second one is it not local government's responsibility? There are national laws um, that prohibit open dumping and burning, but you know there is not the infrastructure there to essentially allow it to be enforced. So political realities on the ground, and Indonesia is a very devolved country. It's you know a lot of power is devolved to the kind of the regencies, um, the Bupati. Um, it, it essentially means that you know it is not enforced. So. Um, you can sit there and say, is it not local government responsibility? Well, it doesn't actually happen. So what we're interested in doing is providing and identifying models and setting up that, you know, okay, the infrastructure showing how technically it can be done, but also setting up that, you know, that financial plumbing. So there is money for it to be happening in the long term to, um, you know, actually make it a reality and actually make it. And, and we're working with really, you know, groundbreaking mayors who are like, no, we need to address this. And that's, you know, essentially how we select our partners. It's the ones who are really kind of up for it, um, who say, no, okay, you know, we're going to make this change and, and are, I know, are also politically willing to stand up for it. So, you know, when you have to say to someone, you need to pay a dollar a month for your waste collection, um, you know, no one likes paying for anything they weren't paying for before. And so you need those politicians to stand, local politicians to stand there and go, no, you know, this is for the betterment of society, you'll be living in a healthier place, much better for the environment, you know, and so, yeah, we stand behind it, and we're going to make it happen, and that's, that's, uh, you know, the reality. Sorry, relax me, back to you. Yeah, no, I think, um, Icha, would you take the question about regulations, and also about landfill? Uh, okay, uh, so about the regulation, uh, so we have a national regulation, so like all the law and also uh, government regulation. And also besides the national regulation, uh, we also have a uh, regency regulation. So national regulation also, uh, they're specific about disposal facilities. So TPA, so uh, one of uh, ministry uh, uh, submit, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm not submit, but have a regulation about the disposal facilities, what the requirement for the disposal facilities. So this is also uh, not only in the national regulation level, but also in the regency. So regency also uh, adapt uh, the, the regulation from the national to implement in the in the regency because sometimes in the regency they all they have a fa disposal facilities so they have uh require a uh, regulation also for that and then because the regency has to um allow the regulation national and then regency to and then uh to meet the requirement to have the disposal facilities uh this is and this the next question about the do the local government charge the real the real estate taxes to fund government uh, services? So this is not like to fund the government uh, services, but the government have uh, regulation about the retribution and also uh, uh, maybe like taxes in in some countries uh, for the for the waste, and then they will collect it uh, the money, and then it will be goes to the uh, regency treasury, and then regency treasury will divided this uh, revenue to cost all the regions in it not only the uh, not only the uh, the waste so maybe some of this uh, money from the from the waste taxes or, or waste uh, retribution goes to the um, waste management uh, services in the, in the Indonesia that's why we want to make uh, the other entity uh, or institutional like we mentioned before Bell UD because Bell UD if they charge the taxes or the, the retribution to the to the uh, community or uh, co uh, company uh, they can get the money directly and then they can use that money also directly to the uh, waste management services uh, I think uh, that can I uh, answer there I miss other question um, no, that's great. Thanks, uh, thanks, each. Uh, I'm just going to kind of touch on a few of the other ones. Uh, the local government, local governments charge real estate taxes to fund government services. Uh, Icha, your in terms of taxation, what is local taxation situation? 
uh the the local taxes is now so this is a uh, very uh, interesting in Banyuwangi so Banyuwangi just um have the taxes the waste taxes by the way uh the waste taxes is this year because of Banyuwangi hijau program so they already have yeah. this regulation before they don't uh, have this regulation and then after we with this program uh, they already have this regulation uh, in this uh, in the regency this is uh, already officiated and then will be uh, socialized uh, to the to the community so they can uh, start to pay, to pay the taxes the waste taxes brilliant i mean so so just i think there's a good interesting broader point there you know look in, in many cases there aren't uh, you know kind of many financial flows to to local government and to start you know when you start delivering services you have to start paying for them now um if you want to deliver a universal service like um solid waste collection and that's where we really start seeing the public health and the kind of environmental benefits um you know you, you can't have yeah, you that leads you to the fact that it probably needs to be indirect um uh, taxation um why because if you're having household fees well you know if someone doesn't pay their household fee do you continue to collect from there even though the community as a whole is benefiting so it ends up leading to that idea that we need taxation and to have taxation you have to have that those that infrastructure in place um and obviously of course you need the kind of the the, the, the internal financial systems to kind of allocate those budgets properly so um, there is there's one thing I just wanted to touch on. I've seen there's been a few questions about TPR, uh, sort of the or the landfill site, the dump sites. We have made a conscious decision. We work in terms of collect. So you know, um, project stop. It works in terms of public engagement. It's um, collection systems. There's a sortation system. So the material is collected. It goes through. It's two streams. It goes. There's an organic stream, and the material is composted, and there is a dry. Uh, non-organic stream uh, where recyclables are pulled out. We have generally about 20 streams, a lot of uh, flexible plastics, some rigid uh, paper, um, cardboard, uh, metals, as there is. But as I said, there's a very vibrant and kind of active informal sector who's had most of that stuff before we get it. And then it passes on to the Delhada Local Environment Agency, and that goes to a regency-operated dump site landfills. And we have you know, specifically made that decision. So that's that's the kind of boundaries of, of where we work, you know, working within the waste system, waste scene, and also working within recycling. I mean, you know, it's, you, you have to be kind of clear about where the boundaries that you're going to end your work at. Now, obviously, um, we could get more involved in kind of understanding and working with um, landfill sites, we don't. I mean, there are challenges. You know, there's been a lot of landfill fires in Indonesia recently. There's ongoing challenges with um, siting and finding space for landfills um, and so forth. So there's a lot of work that has to be done there. And, you know, we, we're aware of that, but there's a lot of, frankly, a lot of work that has to be done everywhere. So you know, we have we are clear about the kind of the, the conceptual boundaries around what we do. Um, there is, I'm, you know, we are not disposal. Um, we are not disposal experts, so each uh, unless there's something that you know about kind of the, the national regulations around disposal facilities that you want to talk to. Uh, yeah, for uh, disposal, uh, because we are now, uh, because we know that the, the in, in Indonesia we have this uh, disposal, uh, disposal reg regulation, and then our target also in in government also about the uh, how. Uh, reduce uh waste or uh uh to the, the to the TPA because this is like uh the question that because uh government have a plan to close the TPA in 2020 uh, 10, uh 33 but this is also our our project that uh concern yeah. when uh government and then community uh concern sorry Uh, concern about uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, concern about the assortation and then we because we want that this uh this um this waste will be finished in the TPA stay not uh, to the uh, to the 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 uh, TPA because this is also what the uh, Ministry of uh Environment concern about the disposal uh facilities 
because so many happen in this year in, in Indonesia, uh, TPA landfill, uh, something yeah, happening in, uh, in the, our landfill, and then this is, will be concerned and um, focus for the uh, Ministry of Environment for next year, how the TPA will uh, manage better, and then uh, to also about the sanitary landfill in the future, so we don't have to have like the illegal dumping or uh yeah uh, illegal landfill also because this has happened and actually in the in the government in Indonesia also there, there are a regulation uh for the disposal and also illegal dumping but uh the homework of uh of uh, government now is a uh, law enforcement for this uh for this um illegal dumping or uh, uh or also like illegal landfill so this is uh not only like government homework but also the uh, also all all of us uh, need uh, participation for this so in the next future uh we hope that uh, about the TPA because like um, Mike mentioned in in stop and, and in systemic project we concern about the sortation and so we reduce uh the waste for the TPA and then this is uh met with the uh, government government uh plan for the waste management I think uh, uh that's from my uh, my side Mike Oh, hold on. Sorry, I've done something strange. Um, great. Okay, so I'm just having a look. Um, there's a few more bits and pieces. What is done with low value but waste? Um, so look, I mean, I think it's yeah. There is very high collection rates of you know materials that can be collected uh, profitably in Indonesia. I mean, like we're seeing seventy percent plus of PET and so forth. I mean, I could literally I could put a box of PET metal glass you know rigid plastics outside my house and within probably two or three hours it would have been gone by what we call the pemulung people on scooters going past there's a lot of you know and so very um very active um low value waste we are we are doing a lot of waste we, we've set up an aggregator working with a local partner waste of change where we are essentially aggregating large amounts of material of, of flexible plastic we get a lot through stock because it's you know essentially it's residual what's left over when the informal sector don't that don't want and we are working with um kind of upstream partners to see how we can basically you know really push up the prices um for end users so that means that it would support the economics of our our um, systems and also we have found that our TPSDs often act as local buyers for the informal sector because they are bulking material they can often kind of cut out many of the middlemen um, that are involved in the informal sector and actually give uh, the informal sector a lot of a lot better prices than people who are collecting, which is obviously a good thing in terms of poverty alleviation. But addressing low value waste, um, we also, um, you know, uh, get a lot of organic, 67% of organic. You know, it has to be dealt with cheaply. It has to be dealt with locally. And we do kind of windrow composting to do that. It's a challenge sometimes. I mean, in, in pastoral one, we just couldn't get rid of the stuff. We couldn't find anyone to take um, organic. So it's something we're really focused on. And we're actually a lot more hopeful about with our big um, program in Banyuwangi at the moment. Um, in terms of revenue, it's just, and this came back to an earlier one, look about tw just kind of roughly speaking around 20, 25% of the revenue is comes from material sales, 20 to 25% depends on obviously on what prices are doing. About 50%-ish plus tends to come from household fees and the rest will come from local government commitment and support. Now, um, if we can push up payment rates, we get uh, more of that from household fees. But that's, you know, it's it's clear, it's, it's really important to be kind of clear and honest that you will, you know, the material values will not cover the price of running a program yeah and there needs to be honesty there particularly when you're working in a place with a vibrant informal sector we're not going to do anything to harm the informal sector or put them out of a job you know we're just not interested in that and our funders certainly aren't interested in that you know they're, they're doing what they do very well we're interested in the residual waste stuff they aren't interested in so um Slow value waste. Um, just in terms of collection rates, as in, I mean, I think there's a broader point about data. We've got a load of, you know, we do a lot of, lot of data collection, and we are happy to share some of, you know, we have a kind of an IP sharing policy, and we're happy to share a lot of our material. I mean, I've literally been sending out waste characterizations this morning. So, Mike, if you are interested in, you know, some of our background data and waste characterizations and bits and pieces, happy to share that. Um, so. 
um, honestly. And just Ratti's comment right at the end, I can see we're at time now. Um, yeah, I mean, the budget is the key thing. I think we've talked about OPEX. We've talked about how do you do it? You know, there's a, in, in my view, and colleagues, please jump in if you disagree, but I, you know, people need to understand that waste costs, and we're not talking about much money. It's the price of a packet of cigarettes every month. You know, but you need to understand to pay it. And it's not about willingness to pay. It's about understanding that it's even something you pay, need to pay. You know, it's not, people think, oh, you know, waste is like the air we breathe. It's just something, it should be, be free. It's not for free if you're going to be dealing with it properly. It's not going to cost much, but you just need to understand you have to pay for it. Okay, I think we're at time sweater. So back to you. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Lakshmi. And thank you, Haricha. As usual, this was a very in-depth discussion conversation and i see that the audience was pretty involved as well with respect to the questions and i hope you have received all your answers this is to the audience members if you feel like connecting with either uh, with any of the three of them they're all available on linkedin and project staff has its own website as well so you can go you can get in touch through any of these mediums i'm very sure uh mike haricha and uh, uh, Lakshmi will be more than happy to answer your questions and we have another webinar uh, happening tomorrow uh, which uh, is based, uh, which has a panel from India. So please, if you haven't signed up for it, you can head to our website and you could sign up for it. And just another reminder about our fundraising campaign, which you will find again on our website. And I see that Mike has dropped in his email on chat in case any of you wants to connect to them. Thanks a lot to all three of you. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Absolute pleasure. Bye -bye. Please get in touch if you have any questions. Thanks.